Good morning, everybody. Thank you for dialing in for the October ERM Toolbox webinar. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. If you've dialed in by phone but you haven't logged in by web and you'd like to see the slides that are shown during today's presentation, please point your web browser to readytalk.com. In the box that says Participant Join a Meeting, enter the same access code that you used for the call, 987-9821. Scroll down on the next screen, enter your contact information, and click the button to register, and you will then be put in the, web in the webinar and able to see the slides. Please stay aware of the level of background noise in your area, and if it becomes noisy, please put your phone on mute. If your phone doesn't have a mute button, you can use the ReadyTalk controls, which are star 6 to mute and star 7 to unmute. We will be leaving the phone lines open, so if you have a question, you can ask during the presentation, or feel free to use the chat box. Uh, I believe that's in the lower left corner of your screen. I'll be keeping an eye on that, and we'll relay any questions to our presenters at an appropriate pause. Also, because of noise, if you're called away from the phone, please do not put your phone on hold. That will transmit your hold music to everybody else on the call. You can simply hang up, dial back in when you're available, and it will not disrupt the call. So with that, let me introduce our presenters today. Adam Stone is a regulatory specialist with expertise in all significant compliance and data protection regimes and industry standards. His 14 years of experience with data privacy and security innovation and leadership includes experience with directing response to actual breach events within organizations. Mike Edlund has 25 years of experience conducting IT security assessment, risk assessments, and data security projects, including experience with major data breach response simulations and lessons learned activities. Gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. This is Mike Edland. I would like to introduce uh, Adam Stone. He'll be presenting uh, the lion's share of the uh, discussion today. I'll uh, pipe in on occasion. Uh, we'll go to our first slide here, and I'll let Adam start. Thanks, Mike. <coughs> Hi, all. Adam Stone uh, here, and thanks for having me uh, today. And uh, good morning to all the folks on the, the uh, West Coast. Uh, the, uh, the title for our presentation today is Preparing for the Big One, and, and I recognize uh, the, uh, that there's a little bit of hyperbole in, in that uh, title, and I think that uh, there's, uh, there was some intentional, uh, there, obviously it was intentional uh, and intended to provoke a little bit, um, but you know, the, the reality of, uh, as I reflect on, on the title itself, uh, the, the reality is, is that uh, oftentimes we, the, the big one, uh, quote unquote, um, rarely presents itself I immediately to an organization. Oftentimes, um, things will, uh, an incident, for instance, will uh, metastasize into something uh, uh, larger, and, and uh, it, it may grow and grow. And before you know it, you are dealing with quote the big one. Uh, 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 even though you may not have uh, uh, recognized it originally. So uh, uh, with that, I'm going to move on to the next slide. These are pictures of, uh, of us, and I thank the, the, uh, the chair for giving, the, the, uh, uh, giving us a little bit of a bio. Uh, a bio. Uh, and as you can see, uh, my colleague Mike uh, has the CISM and CISSP certs, and, and uh, I too have a number of uh, industry certs, including the privacy uh, certification CIPP. And if we can move on to the next slide. All right. Uh, I'm breaking with tradition uh, a little bit in the presentation of the topics uh, for our slide to really drive a point. For, the first point is that the development uh, and the planning uh, of incident response and breach response is a, uh, an iterative process. And it really never ends. It's a, it's a, continuous, it's a continually improving process. Uh, wherever uh, you happen to be in this process, and let me just go through the kind of the, the process starting at the top uh, at the top at 12 o'clock. Uh, obviously, as you think about planning, you're going to want to think about uh, the need and, and, and recognize that you have a need to uh, plan ahead for, uh, uh, for an incident, for breach, and that's part of the reason, I assume, why you are here on the phone call today. 
we'll discuss that in a little bit. Uh, moving from there, we have some thoughts on building mock scenarios and some of the ideas, uh, some of the underlying concepts that go into building mock scenarios. After that is the actual development uh, and putting a pen to paper, uh, as it were, on the development of, of plans to both respond to, uh, to respond to incidents as they occur, as well as uh, communicating uh, to various individuals throughout the process. Next, we're going to move to the actual uh, simulation process and, and conducting the simulations. The, the, uh, one of the documents that uh, may be separate from an incident planning document is something that, that uh, uh, we here at Secure Digital Solutions uh, uh, create, uh, which is called a playbook. And really, that's, that is uh, something like a, uh, 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 an agenda for conducting uh, scenario or simulations for breach uh, for breach uh, response. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. After we conduct our simulation activities, obviously we're going to want to uh, take away some uh, important uh, bits of information from those and use that to improve our plan moving forward. And that's the the next step, which is uh, to improve and enhance the documentation. And then we start the process anew. Uh, the, the folks on this call today may, may be at different parts of the process. I'm going to assume that not every person, for instance, is, is at the process of recognizing the need. You may already be past that. You may be at a different stage of this, this process, but again, in the spirit of an iterative process, it's important to kind of recognize all of these basic steps. All right, so first off, uh, as we think about why we need to plan for this, and, and you know, a lot of if you were to ask uh, if you were to ask somebody in this in this business, you know, why do we need to plan? You know, to to a normal or in you know before actually thinking deeply about it, you know, it's pretty it's pretty self-evident why we would need to plan. However, uh, some of the things that that uh, we've experienced as we uh, it, Excuse me. As we uh, are, uh, as we have helped other folks uh, plan for incidents and plan for simulations and conduct simulations, is that there's a few uh, axioms that that uh, kind of come out uh, uh, and boil to the top. The first one is uh, really we determined is is self-evident in almost every circumstance, which is that no matter how good your security and privacy controls are, incidents are going to happen. That's just a fact of life. Uh, so it's better to plan for them, better for, to plan for the inevitability rather than to stick one's head in the sand and pretend that uh, they just aren't going to happen because our controls are too good. The, the, uh, another uh, axiom that uh, we, we uh, uh, have experienced is that during an incident is actually the worst time to learn how chaotic an incident can be and how quickly things can spiral out of control as you are trying to manage an incident. So obviously planning can help mitigate some of that and at the very least help prepare an organization mentally uh, for uh, and, and to acknowledge, to recognize that these things can and will spiral out of control. We've also recognized that the public and, and, and stakeholders are becoming increasingly savvy as it comes to uh, data breach news. We're getting constant uh, news articles and other media uh, stories relating to other organizations' uh, data, breach, data breach scenarios, data breach circumstances, and the public is uh, starting to understand, uh, uh, is, uh, well, they're, they're understanding better. They're also starting to ask more pointed questions. And uh, with that, I think it behooves organizations that are planning for this, uh, these sorts of events to be ready to answer those sort of pointed questions when they do come. And I don't say if, I say when they do come, because they will. Last but not least, uh, you know, a plan, 
uh, and the amount of work that you put into planning is going to be directly proportionate to how resilient your organization uh, uh, becomes in the face of a breach or an incident. And uh, with that, Mike, if you will. Thank you very much. All right, at this uh, stage, we're going to talk a little bit about building mock scenarios. Uh, what is a mock scenario? In general, a mock scenario is uh, you and your organization, your team, uh, imagining different bad things that could possibly happen that lead to uh, an event, a negative event. Um, on the bottom right hand of our uh, slide here, I have a little uh, graphic that, that uh, illustrates how we categorize uh, these negative events. And actually, we, we, they, these events, in our view, um, will escalate into three different uh, levels, as it were. The first level we call an incident. And the best way to think about an incident is, for instance, if your IT department uh, you know, notices or discovers that somebody is attempting to or has successfully hacked into a given system. Um, that may be uh, a, an incident. Uh, those incidents sometimes uh, escalate into events called breaches. We define a breach as uh, an event, an incident, which has escalated to the point where we, we may need to um, either because we have a regulatory or a contractual driver uh, or because it's just good business practice, uh, we may need to uh, notify part, certain parties, whether they're regulators, the public, clients, uh, so on and so forth. We call that a breach. Now, uh, a breach uh, can escalate to a full-blown crisis. A full-blown crisis, uh, I think to put uh, in, in, in the simplest terms, is an event that, that's going to cause some serious uh, dis business distraction uh, at the very least. Uh, it's going to divert uh, resources away from um, their normal productive uses and uh, uh, direct those resources towards uh, trying to uh, uh, patch the dike, as it were. And uh, with that said, that can have some pretty serious uh, impacts in terms of uh, reputation, in terms of uh, uh, ill will, in terms of money, and uh, and so with that, just want to make clear that we that we think of uh, these uh, scenarios in terms of their their escalation points of incident, breach, and crisis. As you build mock scenarios, I'm going to want to think about uh, building a small library or a small database of scenarios, and you're going to want those mock scenarios to be, uh, to, 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 uh, be different. Uh, you're going to want some to be uh, large. You're going to want some to be small. You're going to want some to uh, happen uh, in a way that uh, it impacts the organization very quickly, others which maybe it creeps up on the organization. You're going to want to have scenarios which uh, perhaps you know uh, you, you have a lot of information about what's going on. For instance, if it's an IT incident, uh, you, you may have a lot of forensic evidence to go by. If it's not an IT incident, or you know, it could be uh, uh, if it's another incident where you may not have a lot of information uh, to, uh, to go by, but you're still going to be in a position where you need to make decisions regardless of the uh, quality or the amount <coughs> of it. It is important that as you build these scenarios, that they add value to your organization and that they are realistic to your organization. Uh, what I mean is that if, you're a, if you are a small healthcare system, you're not going to want to build a scenario that is probably more appropriate for a large bank. Uh, you're, you're, if you are uh, a, an academic institution, you, you uh, may not uh, find it valuable to, uh, uh, you know, to have a scenario uh, that relates to something that is not relating to the mission of the academic institution. Make sure that they are realistic for your organization, and that could be, as I speak to that, I don't necessarily mean for your entire organization either. If you represent a business unit, if you represent a product line or a service line, 
make sure that uh, it is uh, scoped appropriately for uh, your needs. Last but not least, uh, you're going to want to do what you can to get the executive management involved. We've been in, we've been in uh, some scenarios where we've had uh, the CEO directly and very actively involved in uh, these mock scenarios. And this person was uh, enthusiastic and uh, really appreciated being part of it. Other organizations may not have that sort of uh, culture, uh, may not have that sort of, um, uh, it just, the, the CEO may not be ready uh, or other executive uh, management may not be ready um, to actively engage. But where you can, I would uh, recommend that you try to build a few scenarios where uh, the executive management are actively participating. And, uh, next. As it pertains to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as we move now from uh, thinking about mock scenarios, uh, let's talk a little bit about actually the, the uh, planning process and um, what an organization is going to commit to uh, paper uh, in terms of the planning process. Before we actually uh, think about uh, putting pen to paper for our communications plan, it, I think it would be helpful for organizations to consider uh, a few underlying, uh, a few underlying uh, thoughts. Uh, first off, uh, wh when you are developing a, uh, a in our experience, uh, we've learned that when an organization a, it does not have a solid understanding of what it stands to lose, in the event of a, of, a, of a breach or an incident, uh, then it's going to be very difficult for that organization to develop a plan that really meets their needs. What I mean by that is that, it, you know, it, you, you know, depending on where you work, and who you work for, what your product is, um, there's going to be uh, diff different values, relative values applied to the products, the services um, that you offer. And uh, it may be if you represent an organization with uh, multiple products or services, they may differ in terms of uh, the, w their relative value to your clients, to your stakeholders, uh, and to other folks. Make sure that you understand those differences. Make sure to document those differences. You also want to think about how resilient uh, your organization is generally. What sort of culture does your organization have? How uh, in, your, uh, in your experience, how has your organization been able to bounce back from other crises that have occurred that are not data breach circumstances? Cer certainly, organizations experience crises of all different types, including data breach uh, scenarios. How does your organization handle that? How quickly, how easily was it able to bounce back uh, from such a circumstance? Perhaps it uh, is still dealing with uh, a crisis situation, and you may want to ask yourself, wow, you know, what would a data breach do to uh, add more pain to an already painful situation? And so you definitely want to think about that and have that inform uh, w your plan, your documented plan moving forward. Last but not least, you want to uh, also consider how transparent your organization is willing to be in the face of a data breach. One of the things that we've learned is that organizations that try to um, uh, try to to cover up, as I know that's a harsh statement, but um, try to uh, uh, downplay or cover up uh, a, a negative circumstance like a data breach, they're going to get found out at some point. Something, somebody is going to leak it, something's going to happen, and that is going to have a uh, much more negative impact on the organization, potentially, than it would have if the organization were to uh, be transparent in, uh, in the breach and how the breach occurred and make sure that it does it in a, in a uh, reasonably timely fashion. So you want to think about, uh, in general, is your organization prepared to be that transparent? Uh, if not, 
you're going to want to adjust your plan uh, accordingly. And I'll, I'm going to pass it, uh, the next slide off to Mike Edlund here. All righty. Thank you, Adam. Uh, these elements here are effectively some of the documented portions of your plan. Um, as we have discussed earlier, to take a peek at what those scenarios potentially might look at, important elements of that will be what data in relation to IT um, value the data has and also what stakeholders are impacted, who they are and how they might be impacted by a data breach scenario. Um, these scenarios could be uh, developed in a risk management type framework so that you can understand the impacts, likelihood, that type of information as you develop them. And once you understand the various scenarios and have that uh, catalog, as, as Adam has uh, noted, uh, then you need to look at who is needed with regard to an incident response team. Um, these scenarios may require a different incident response team depending on what they look like. For example, uh, an incident that may involve, say, a physical security or a maybe a, a shooter in a parking lot scenario, for example, would require a, an entirely different incident response team than an IT breach where someone has hacked into systems and uh, illegally and uh, unauthorized way uh, obtained data. Uh, so you need to really determine what that incident response team looks like uh, for the various scenarios. Uh, there may be some commonality, but there may be differences that are required. Uh, thirdly, we need to look at uh, those scenarios and then understand what uniform procedures and communications we can develop around them. Ideally, we'll have as much uniformity of process uh, in dealing with the incident as pro possible and as also with regard to communications. This is a great opportunity as you look at the different scenarios to understand how one might build out checklists to uh, uh, react to, for example, uh, a uh, hacking incident and how investigation and uh, containment of that might occur using uh, templates and checklists. Um, in addition, templates can be developed in regard to communications options uh, depending upon the scenario. Uh, they may need to go to local media, they may need to go to uh, customer stakeholders that might be internal to the organization and all those templates could be developed in such a way and we've seen this where they can be uh, injected with elements of the uh, current scenario and uh, can then be uh, used in a specific situation, but nonetheless still generic enough that they can be reused for several different scenarios. Uh, finally, an important element of dealing with incidents, and there needs to be some escalation points around this, and Adam may be talking a bit more about these, but um, oftentimes an organization finds that it's, it's in over its head uh, with regard to an incident. It becomes so large with regard to either being a breach or with regard to being a crisis that they need to bring in third parties, including law enforcement. Some of these additional third parties might be, for example, uh, recent um, scenarios that we've seen in the news you need credit monitoring, for example, if there was a, a data breach related to credit card uh, numbers. Um, other areas, there might be call centers to deal with customers, uh, to deal with uh, media uh, inquiries or uh, customer responses. Uh, thirdly, uh, common two areas are with regard to outside legal help, typically dealing with data breaches, and secondarily, um, uh, the uh, use of forensics and uh, an additional area might be with regard to uh, public relations. Uh, as Adam noted, some of these things can spiral out of control and, and keep the organization uh, looking as uh, good as it can in response to a scenario uh, is an important piece of that. All right, moving on. 
uh, we have uh, different positive elements of having a good plan in place. Um, ideally, we've got uh, either workflow, we've got some uh, different processes in place so that decisions can occur at a, as a known and planned event as opposed to a um, spiraling out of control type of situation. Um, a flow chart may be helpful in this uh, regard as well. Um, oftentimes organizations uh, develop silos between different elements and areas or departments within an organization. And this is oftentimes very detrimental with regard to uh, working with uh, these types of incidents. Uh, folks in different parts of the organization need to work together. You have uh, sales people, for example, need to talk to their customers, and at the same time, the IT people may be needed to be uh, investigating the um, incident. And then thirdly, as some communications area may be uh, needing to uh, be putting out uh, various uh, media or customer notifications and that type of thing. So people have to work together to get this all uh, coordinated. Um, thirdly, um, a unified message for the folks that are speaking internally and externally uh, to the organization or to uh, media, customers, etc. Uh, we need a unified message. Uh, someone that can put together key speaking points and those are common across all messaging that occurs regardless of if it's internal or external to the organization. Um, damage can be limited as you effectively and in a planned and coordinated method uh, go about dealing with an incident as opposed to it spiraling out of control. And finally, uh, controls and, and a handle can uh, be kept with regard to an incident, uh, the, incident the organization can uh, bounce back and really do better uh, as a result of dealing with the organization, I'm sorry, the uh, incident. Um, an organization that learns from uh, these events and also as we'll talk about doing some simulations of the events will be in a much better place to bounce back um, when they actually do occur. I'll pass the baton back to Adam. He can speak a little bit more about some of the uh, elements and, and uh, pieces that we can have in relation to these uh, uh, planning. Thanks, Mike. So the, uh, to kind of wrap up some of the, the uh, uh, best practices that we have learned uh, in helping other organizations deal with or plan for uh, incidents, breaches, uh, crises, uh, are uh, these, uh, these uh, elements here on, on uh, this slide. Just quickly going through these. First off, we, I had mentioned earlier uh, the development of a, a playbook. Uh, we were basically a playbook is a little different than the actual uh, breach, uh, excuse me, the incident uh, plan or the incident response plan in that the playbook is, it sets uh, kind of the rules uh, for doing the simulations themselves. And it should be uh, reusable. Some of the things that would go in a playbook, for instance, would be uh, logistics, uh, would be who, uh, what teams would be involved in simulation, would be uh, areas uh, such as when, is, when does an incident, when's the official starting point of an incident, when's the official ending point of an incident simulation. Uh, and so it's all of the sort of logistical and administrative questions that one uh, would want to ask uh, when developing a, uh, a, a simulation, whether it's a tabletop simulation or a day-long, uh, a day-long, uh, perhaps a little bit more detailed simulation. Uh, having a playbook is, is uh, really helpful. Uh, we mentioned it before, uh, but we'll say it again. Make sure that the scenarios that uh, are developed uh, are reality-based. Also, it, one of the other things we learned is that uh, uh, as you want, as you prepare to exercise a particular scenario, 
you are going to want to uh, uh, get the buy-in from executive uh, management as you do it. We have learned that there are uh, sensitivities, and uh, rightfully so, in some of the scenarios. And uh, as such, you don't want to uh, catch anybody uh, by surprise. And so make sure to loop in all of the appropriate executives to make sure that they're comfortable with the scenario that, uh, or scenarios that you plan to exercise. Uh, make sure that, uh, obviously, you're going to want to make sure that uh, any planning that you do is going to be uh, uh, closely aligned with your organization's goals and objectives and success factors. Uh, that's, that's, a, uh, that's really a, a given. What is also a given is that, you, that a good plan establishes very clear roles and responsibilities for every single player uh, involved, both internal and external uh, players and groups that uh, are ta or who are tasked with uh, the uh, responsibility for for helping uh, be part of the management of an incident. You're going to want to think about escalation triggers. Very important. Uh, you you may recall that we have those three levels: starting at incident, then kind of moving to breach, and then from there it might move or escalate to a full-blown crisis. You're going to want to make sure that you understand um, that point or that trigger uh, to know when uh, something has escalated to that point. And the obvious reason is uh, that different uh, people may become involved uh, as a particular scenario starts to metastasize or starts to escalate uh, from an incident to breach to uh, crisis. Make sure that you understand the triggers or at least uh, very broadly have a concept of, of when uh, these triggers occur. Last but not least, also make sure that you have a good sense of when third parties are going to need to be brought in. Uh, you, your organization may determine that third parties are going to be brought in no matter the incident, uh, no matter the, the uh, uh, severity of the incident. It's just that's the way you're going to go about things. Other organizations may choose to bring in third parties only when needed. And next slide. Now uh, is where uh, we, we have the most fun, which is actually conducting the simulations themselves. There are a lot of different ways to conduct uh, in, uh, preparation or, or preparedness simulations or incident response simulations. Uh, and there are a ton of resources uh, out on the, on the Internet that uh, are related to incidents uh, the crises of various sorts, whether they're things like school shooters or, or uh, pandemics or things of that nature. And uh, I would recommend that uh, as you are thinking about uh, what sort, how your uh, simulation will actually uh, 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 be conducted, to look at some of the lessons uh, learned and some of the ways that, uh, that other organizations that deal with other types of incidents uh, actually conduct their scenarios. In a little picture, for instance, that I, that, uh, I have at the right of this slide, um, there's a, uh, uh, this, this is a picture of an organization that's going through some um, uh, security incident uh, simulation, and there's a guy with an orange vest whose responsibility it is to basically observe what's going on. Uh, uh, throughout the simulation, and, and uh, you can see here that this is you know, this is basically a uh, what we would call a tabletop exercise. And you can see a few of the participants here uh, conducting that exercise. May, so, as <coughs> a few points to consider when you're conducting these these simulations, when you are planning for incident uh, response simulations. First off, make sure that you have full commitment from the participants. Uh, it, uh, a simulation is only as, it, it, it is only as good as uh, the effort that the folks who are participating uh, put into it. Make sure that you have full commitment from these folks. You're also going to want to set some rules for uh, acceptable or appropriate behavior. Uh, one of the things that we found is that if these rules um, are not set up front, uh, you can have a situation, especially in a politically charged environment, uh, where uh, you have a lot of finger pointing and blaming happening. 
And really, this is not a, uh, an appropriate environment or appropriate uh, venue for uh, passing blame uh, or pointing blame at uh, individuals. Everybody in the simulation is there to learn, and mistakes are going to be made, and uh, nobody in the simulation, or no organization, no person, no department should be shamed for uh, what may be uh, 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 considered a, a mistake or a lack of preparation, for instance. That's the reason why we have these simulations. So set the rules ahead of time. Make sure that, you, that, that uh, folks are uh, contributing to a positive learning environment. Make sure that, uh, and this, uh, the next step is, is an obvious one, but it's important. Make sure that you have all the materials that you need available. In the little picture uh, off to the right, you, you may be able to discern uh, a little um, projector on the table so that uh, folks can project whatever they need to project on a screen. Uh, they have all sorts of supplies next to them, paper, pencils, whatever might be needed. An important element to any, data, uh, any simulation uh, that goes be over an hour or more is food. <laughs> uh, make sure that you keep people, uh, uh, keep people fed and make sure that you have uh, adequate uh, food and, and, and drink uh, 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 available to folks. Uh, last but not least, uh, notice again the guy in the orange vest in the simulation picture. Uh, it is important to have objective uh, reviewers or evaluators kind of watching what's going on. These people are not uh, uh, there to participate actively in the simulation itself. itself. They are there to observe the participants and to uh, document their observations. Some other thoughts that we have. As you're conducting a simulation, do what you can to get away from the office. Uh, you, you know, a simulation, again, in the vein of, the, of uh, full participation, uh, really you don't want uh, folks that are participating to be called, uh, called away um, for uh, non-essential or relatively non-essential uh, 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 issues. You want to make sure that these folks are fully engaged. One of the best ways to do that is to take them away from the office. If you can do that, great. Uh, if you cannot do that, uh, what we have uh, found works is that you, you have a conference room or something of that sort uh, within the facility, but you have signs on the conference room that, that uh, st state very clearly, uh, do not disturb, uh, simulation in progress, and uh, again, in terms of setting rules for acceptable behavior, ask the participants to ask uh, their uh, staffers, for instance, if we're talking about a manager, to, to not interrupt them unless it's an absolute emergency. Um, any, uh, one of the additional things that we found uh, adds a little bit of excitement uh, and realism to any simulation is to inject surprise elements uh, as, as you go along. We, we find that, that um, and we call these uh, elements injects, and what we recommend is that as you develop uh, these injects, th they're only uh, shared, at least initially, uh, among a few select planners of the simulation. In other words, you do not want to let the, uh, the, 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 all the participants know that the uh, injects are coming. And the injects are, you know, they, they really reflect reality. Uh, here's an example that, that we did in a recent uh, simulation. We, we had an inject that uh, had one of the key participants in the simulation fall ill. And that participant, we, we uh, uh, put a little uh, tag uh, around it on that participant saying, this person is ill, you cannot call this person. And uh, the group then had to figure out what to do uh, in the absence of a, one of the key players in the simulation. Those are the sorts of injects which uh, 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 really add some good realism and really help, uh, help the organization understand just how resilient its planning process is. Uh, in any simulation, 
uh, you're going to have some wayward thoughts. You're going to have some folks that, that um, uh, uh, take note uh, or observe certain things or perhaps may come up with some great ideas on how to mitigate uh, certain shortcomings. And you know what? That's great. That's what we're all here for, for simulations. But uh, we're here for a very specific purpose, and so you want to make sure to set the rules again in advance and say, look, uh, folks, if we do have wayward thoughts that gets us off uh, track, uh, we're going to send them to a parking lot. We'll address them later and uh, make sure that as you do that, you have that parking lot. You have a little um, uh, flip chart or a little uh, uh, board somewhere that, that, uh, where you can document the uh, so-called parking lot uh, items. Last but not least, one, one of the things that we learned uh, perhaps the hard way is that you want to uh, make sure that uh, folks, if, for instance, you, you are conducting a simulation uh, in a conference room in your facility, you want to make sure that folks realize that it is a simulation and not the real thing. Uh, one of the things that uh, can occur uh, is, is uh, the, the, um, uh, the rumor mill uh, may, may uh, start to generate false, uh, 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 false news of something uh, that, uh, uh, quote, uh, something's happening within the organization. You want to make very clear that um, uh, this is not a situation that is uh, amenable to rumor. This is merely a simulation, uh, and uh, that will uh, help mitigate some potential heartache that uh, would, occur, uh, would occur internally. So after we have completed our, uh, our simulation, there are uh, uh, one thing that's really important is to uh, make the time to debrief. Preferably, you're going to make that time immediately after the simulation. You may want to give it a day or a half a day or uh, longer to let some thoughts uh, sink in for the participants, but you're not going to want to let it go uh, or uh, wander too many days past the actual event. Uh, you're going to want to uh, ask folks, look, you know, what what do we uh, what, what did we do here that worked? What didn't work? Uh, what did we miss? In ter who did we miss in terms of key players, people, depart uh, departments? Uh, do we miss any stakeholders uh, as we thought through this? Did we miss any third parties that we should have brought into uh, the process? Also, make sure that you that you recognize and ask the questions. Did, did we have any gaps in, in, in our in communication? Uh, did we have any blatant errors? Are there any? Was there anything that that is worthy of a pat on the back? Pats on the back are always good things. Make sure that uh, as you uh, as you ask for these lessons learned, that you incorporate this information into uh, into a, a single document that can be. Uh, that can be uh, uh, summarized for executive management and other uh, key stakeholders who uh, will want to understand, uh, you know, what, what has been taken away from this simulation. Obviously, the next step, once you learn from a simulation, is that you're going to do something about it, uh, and uh, uh, you are going to uh, enhance your processes, perhaps build new processes. <clears throat> uh, obviously, any observations that you take away from a simulation are going to help you uh, overall improve your process and improve the overall responsiveness uh, uh, across departments, within departments, and uh, for individuals as it pertains to dealing with, uh, uh, with an incident or a breach or a crisis or perhaps all of the above. Importantly, uh, uh, you know, a crisis an incident, a breach, all these things are uh, disruptive to an organization and to certain, and they, they vary in their level of disruption. You want to make, uh, you want to uh, take the lessons learned from your simulations to try to minimize those disruptions as much as possible so that you can continue uh, doing what you're there, uh, what you're in business uh, to do. And uh, really, the, that effective planning will help you 
balance uh, perhaps a little bit better the management of an incident uh, concurrent with uh, the maintaining of your business operations. Uh, last but not least, uh, y y you know, I'll tell you something. We, we said it at the beginning, incidents occur, we know that they occur, and uh, as a result, we recommend uh, having plans. There are lots of organizations that say, oh yeah, we've got plans. You know, we know what to do uh, in the event, of, a in the event of, a, of an incident or a breach. Um, but it turns out that those plans haven't been committed to paper and uh, really are, are basically uh, tribal knowledge. You're going to want to take that tribal knowledge and make sure that you put it on paper. Things change in the organization. People come and go. You're going to want to make sure that this process is repeatable and the only way to uh, 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 help ensure that is to have it on paper and formal. And if you and formalized, I should say. And next slide. That is our presentation. We uh, this is a, uh, just a little bit about secure digital solutions. And with that, we we thank you for your. Uh, interest and uh, uh, the time that you spent in uh, listening to uh, listening to us. At this point, we would like to entertain any questions that uh, you may have, and so I'm going to throw it back to uh, the chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, the phone lines are open. Uh, do we have any questions? Well, if you find any questions coming to mind uh, in the aftermath of the presentation, feel free to contact us by email. I'd be happy to relay them to our presenters. And with that, let me thank everybody for dialing in for this month's Toolbox webinar. We hope to see you next month. Thanks very much.